Good morning, church. Uh, the reading we have this morning is from 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the spring of the year, when the kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Then David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to, jo- to David. When Uriah arrived, David asked, how, asked him how Joab and the army was getting along and how the war was progressing. Then he told Uriah, go home and relax. David even sent him a gift uh, to Uriah after he'd left the palace. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, What's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Uriah replied, The ark of the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab, my master's men, are camping in the open fields. How could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again he stepped at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So the next morning David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest then pull back so that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the the enemy soldiers came out to, to the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. Then Joab sent the battle report to David. He told his messenger, report all the news of the battle to the king. But he might get angry and ask, why did the troops get so close to the city? Didn't they know they would be shooting from the walls? Wasn't Abelamech, son of Gideon, killed at Thebes by a woman who threw a millstone down on him off the wall? Why would you get so close to the wall? Then tell him Uriah the Hittite was killed too. So the messenger went to Jerusalem and gave the complete report to David. The enemy came out against us in the open fields, he said, and as we chased them back to the city gate, the archers on the wall shot arrows at us. Some of the king's men were killed, including Uriah the Hittite. Well, tell Job not to be discouraged, David said. The sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow. Fight harder next time and conquer the city. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. When the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son, but the Lord was displeased with what David had done. That Daryl. Thanks, team, for leading us in worship this morning. To uh, really enjoy that song, um, Evidence. It's just, I think it's great. Uh, now I'm trying to get this to work. There it is. So, yes, so today we're speaking from 2 Samuel chapter 11. So kia ora whanau, I'm, Nate, I'm the youth pastor here at North Point and I'm excited to be bringing the word of God to you this morning. So today I'm speaking from 2 Samuel 11 as we heard from Daryl, thank you again. So this is the story of King David and Bathsheba, a lot of us would have heard this growing up throughout the church um, and even in secular communities it's often referred to. So the story where David's eyes lead him into temptation, where he disregards God laws, commits adultery, And as we talk about power and intimacy, I think it's important to note here that intimacy in itself is not evil, nor is it corrupt, or is it wrong, or even a sin. 
What is, though, is eyeing someone up who is not your spouse. And that's exactly what King David does. He looks at his friend's wife and then orders her to come into his chambers and then lies with her. A little bit of historical context is when the king says, come, you listen. When the king says, do this, you do it. It was a very uh, patriarchal system where the king had full power. Bathsheba had no choice but to do what King David said. David forces her to lie with him. He has no regards to how his friend would feel. He has no regard to the laws which God laid before him. And it's interesting in this story because David has so much authority, so much respect, and so much wealth. But it seems to not be enough for him. David demanded more. We could read into the text and imply that he wanted to feel powerful or supreme, or we could say he was, te- he was tempted and gave in to that temptation. But once he is told she's pregnant, Bathsheba is pregnant, he continues in his web of lies and orders, he commands, he demands that her husband, Uriah, is to be killed in battle. For simplicity's sake, another word for that is murder. He gets his friend murdered because David gave in to his temptation. And we often focus on this point. We often focus on the idea that David made several huge mistakes in this in this scripture. The first, which I uh, got pointed out to me this morning by Daryl, was the first line in, in 2 Samuel 11 is, when the kings were at war, David stayed behind. First thing, David should have actually been at that war. Thanks, Daryl, for pointing that out to me this morning. Second thing was that he gave in to this temptation of seeing someone that wasn't his. And then he continues and he lies so he can then commit murder. But if we move on from second, the bottom of 2 Samuel 11 to 2 Samuel 12, we get to see the prophet Nathan. Now, the prophet Nathan is probably one of my favorite characters in the Bible. I think it's quite self-explanatory why. Nathan speaks to him about how this one person, this one peasant had everything. Uh, had, had, had one thing he loved, sorry. This this, this farmer had one sheep that he hand-raised and he loved and he poured his heart into this one thing. And then how this much more wealthy man had everything he ever needed. He had authority, he had wealth, literally everything. And then the wealthy man turns up to the peasant and takes it from him. He takes this one sheep to be slaughtered for a feast. And Nathan says... David, you are that man. And what I really want to focus on today is what David does next. I think the importance and the emphasis has to be on this. David repents. He seeks forgiveness. He knows he did wrong. And so he confesses to Nathan. David states, I have sinned against the Lord. And let's be honest, we have all sinned, haven't we? We have all done something wrong. I think what else we do, though, is when we get caught up in our web of lies or our sin, and when someone confronts us, we can get really defensive really quick. We can blame, we can feel guilt, and so we we put that onto other people. But... Hats off to David in this instance because he owns his mistake. He fesses up to it. For simplicity, David seeks forgiveness and it is received by God. But Nathan says, Your family will live by the sword because you have despised me, God, by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. 
There were consequences for the sin that David committed. And during my study of this scripture, I explored the idea of consequence for sin. And as some may know, sin leads to death. But there's hope because Christ enters the story. David doesn't know this, but Christ, we know this, that Christ died so we may live. Christ died for our sin. David had to face the consequences of his sin. We're not in that exact same place as David, though. We have been set free from sin because of the death, because of, the death of Christ. We have been forgiven from the sins of our past, our current place, and our future because of the death of Christ. Two extremely important things in this is, firstly, Christ died for our sins because of his great love for each and every single one of us. Please hear that. The love of God means he came to earth to be killed on a cross so that we may be reunited with God. Secondly, we are then to, not, we are then to live a life not according to our will, but according to God's. As Paul famously writes in Romans 6.1, Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Certainly not. Or Romans 6.15, What then? Shall we, shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Because we have been given new life with Christ, Paul is urging, encouraging us, telling us, to not live a life of sin, but live a life according to the will of God. But when we do sin, which we will, we must be willing and able to confess our sins to our God and know that his love is for us. And as we speak of seeking a life of, of God's influence within us, there is no way that we're able to be perfect but God does expect us to confess our sins, to, to, to turn away from, to, to repent from, just as David did. God's amazing love is not a set of rules we must follow to get into heaven. But rather, it is a life of freedom, most importantly, love. To sum this up, God's love is greater than any spouse or pet, or child, or friend. And that love which shows us how to live is the same love that shows us what is good for us. Christ's first act on earth was being born as a human, fully human and fully God, to show us what love truly is. Coming back to David and Bathsheba, David was shown grace after he made a series of, of mistakes. David was given a second chance. But that did not free David from the consequences of his mistakes. In fact, David lost a son. His family was to live by the sword, and his family rebelled against him. And although forgiveness and grace was shown, he had to face the music. Or lie in the bed he had made. We, on the other hand, are very fortunate as we have been made free through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Our eternal mistakes have been forgiven. We are able to enter into heaven because of the blood upon the cross. But we, similar to David, have to face the music of our actions Although we no longer have to fear the eternal wrath of God, we still face the consequences of sin. When we lie, when we do right or wrong, there are consequences for that. Let me give an example. When I buy my wife, Gabby, flowers out of the blue, the consequences for that action is love and appreciation. She feels valued. But when I forget her birthday which I don't, by the way, I'm very good at that. 
The consequence is disappointment. And so these consequences are around us all the time. However, we have been set free from sin. But that doesn't mean we're set free from the consequence of sin. The death of Christ has set us free because of love. And that love is truer today, is true today as it was yesterday and it, as it will be tomorrow. My point is very simple today, as I know I've got a few young people like Elijah Dakin watching. David made a series of mistakes. He cheated, he murdered and lied. But by the grace of God, he was forgiven. And we are too. By the grace of God, we have been set free from the chains of sin and darkness and death. We have been set free to live in the abundance life of Christ, to allow God to move through us, to speak to us, and to influence us. And when we make mistakes, which we will, ask for forgiveness, seek prayer from friends. And always be looking for, tr for the strength which comes from Christ. As David says in Psalm 18 verses 2 to 3, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my saviour. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And I am saved from my enemies. The reason I bring up the Psalms is David was feeling that there was a disconnect between him and God for a long period of time. And here he's making a confession, a statement, a declaration that the Lord is his rock. And when we sin, when we get caught up in our, web of, our own web of lies, we sometimes get frustrated, we feel abandoned, we feel alone, but... I want to remind us all that the Lord is our rock. The Lord is our fortress. He is our savior. Today is a good day to declare our God is our rock and our savior. One way in which we can be reminded of the grace of God, one way we can be reminded of the forgiveness of Christ is to take communion, is to remember what Christ did for us all those years ago. So in your hubs, as the music team closes, feel free to take communion. Reflect on the amazing grace of our loving God. Let this communion day serve as a reminder for the grace that our Lord Jesus shows. Just as David experienced grace, we too can experience that same grace. Let us pray. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you have done. Thank you, Jesus, for your life, your death, and your resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing love and grace. Bless us this day, Lord, for you are good. Let us be reminded of you constantly as we go into the week ahead. Let us be a blessing to those around us and remind us that we have been forgiven when we make mistakes. Remind us that your love is with us. Let our ears hear you. Let our eyes see you. And let our hearts bless those who don't know you. Amen. Thank you, team.